So I'm an English professor, and now and then I tell my students this strange, true thing. It's that you will all spend an enormous chunk of your lives lost in storyland, moving through novels, TV shows, films. And I ask them a question that's so big and so basic and so obvious that most of them have really never considered it. And the question is why? Why are we so addicted to fiction? Why do we care so much about the fake struggles of fake people? And most of the students have never considered it before, but eventually a hand comes up and someone says escapism. And everyone nods. What are stories for? They're fun, they're entertainment, they're candy. And escapism is, I think, our culture's dominant theory of the value of story. And I think it gets things just about exactly wrong. That's my daughter, Annabelle, on the left, playing with her big sister. And she's a good girl, but a few years ago, she began fantasizing obsessively, ominously, about my death. She'd kill me with accidents. She'd, she'd blow me up with dynamite. I'd catch diseases. Whatever it took to get me out of the picture. She was five or six at the time, and I was working on this book about storytelling. And so I was spending a great deal of time lurking around on the edges of her make-believe, kind of spying, seeing how it's done. She'd have a friend over. They'd run out to the backyard. Annabelle would say, let's pretend that our parents are dead bited by tigers. And boom, I'm down, I'm dead, I've been bited to death. <laughs> and the little girls are squealing around through Neverland, frolicking, giggling. And watching all this, I kind of felt a little offended. I thought to myself, what a little sicko. <laughs> what a little ingrate. But I was a kid once, and so I could respect it too. With her mother and me safely slaughtered, Safely digested, Annabelle could finally live it up. She could move into her own imaginary Disney, this land of Skittles and curly fries and no broccoli, no timeouts. She could finally escape from all the problems and obstacles in her life, right? Wrong. Wrong. Because the story scenario she dreamed up was called Lost Forest Children. And it turns out that orphan life in a tiger-infested forest isn't that great. Basically, it all comes down to running for your life all the time, shrieking. That's what the game comes down to. When you're a lost forest child, all of life narrows down to fight and flight. You struggle, you think up clever ways to hide and to eat, and if you don't, they will gobble you up. And watching this, I was like, wow, this is really strange. Why did my daughter dream up hell when she could have escaped into heaven? That's a hard question. So ponder it while I tell you a different story. This is the kind of story we call a thought experiment. Imagine you are walking down the street. You find a magical rectangular box lying on the pavement. And the box will allow you to safely and instantly teleport into an alternative universe as an invisible observer, which sounds really good. But there's a catch, and the catch is that there's a warning clearly printed on the box. It says, beware, if you open this magical box, you will experience the protracted torture and murder of women and children. Seemingly decent men will reveal themselves as evil Nazis and sick maniacs. You will feel angry, fearful, nauseous, painfully tense. When you close the box, the bad men will haunt your dreams. So how about you? Do you open the box? Most people would say, no, of course not. Why would I? Why would I want to go there? But you can see, I think, where I'm going. The magical rectangular box is a novel. In fact, it's Stieg Larsson's enormous bestseller, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, and millions and millions of us have willingly, joyfully gone there. So I'm here today to talk to you about this paradox. Human beings, you, me, little Annabelle, we have this almost godlike ability to mentally teleport 
out of our own mundane realities and into alternative story worlds. But we mainly use our superpower to teleport not into heavenly world, worlds, not to escape into hev heavenly worlds, but to go into hellish worlds. Stories are overwhelmingly about trouble. Stories aren't about people having good days. Even comedies, while they might end happily, are about people gutting through bad days, often the very worst days of their lives. This is as true of a Stieg Larsson novel as it is of a silly movie or a classic tragedy like Oedipus Rex or even a Harlequin romance like Cowboy Commando. And in case you're wondering, I don't actually know what Cowboy Commando is about. Exactly. I haven't read it yet. But uh, judging from the cover, it seems like Cowboy Commando might have been on a mission. Maybe getting his chest waxed, uh, <laughs> tastefully oiled. Uh, he loses his shirt. Calamity ensues. I'm pretty sure that's, that's how the novel goes. <laughs> in any case, this is the big question that fascinated me and flummoxed me as I'm, I'm working on my book. It's why. Why are stories so troubled? Why are stories this specific way instead of all the other ways that they could be? And to make this question really pop in your mind, I want to run one more thought experiment. So cast your mind back into the mists of prehistory and imagine that there's just two human tribes living side by side in some African valley. The tribes are in competition for the same finite resources. One of these tribes will gradually pass away. The other tribe will inherit the earth. The tribes are alike in every single way except the way indicated by their names. One tribe is called the story people. The other tribe is called the practical people. So both tribes will hunt. Both tribes gather. Both tribes woo their mates, rear their children. But at the end of the day, the story people want something more. They go back to the village. They throng around the hearth fire. And they make up and trade these wild lies about fake people and fake events. And they have a wonderful time doing it. But all the while, what are these practical people doing? They're out there in the field. They're working more. They're hunting more. They're gathering more. They're wooing more. At the end of the day, they don't waste their time with stories or any other form of art. They go to sleep. They restore their energies for useful activity. So we know how the story ends. The story people inherit the earth. They are us. If those strictly practical people ever existed, they don't anymore. But here's the point. If we hadn't known that at the outset, wouldn't most of us have predicted that those hard-working practical people would outcompete our frivolous story people. The fact that they didn't, that's the evolutionary riddle of fiction. Now, I want to stress at the outset that there's probably multiple correct responses to this riddle. There's many different ideas. They all probably capture part of the truth. I'm just going to focus on one small part of this, one idea that's getting a lot of attention right now from scholars and scientists. So archaeologists will tell you that this is a hand axe from many hundreds of thousands of years ago. But how do they know? Well, in fact, they don't know. They don't have a time machine. They never saw one of our caveman ancestors use one of these on a mountain goat. They made a strong, educated guess. They jumped from the form of this object to a hypothesis about likely function. They say, well, you know, it looks like it was shaped by human hands, for human hands. Uh, it's got these sharp edges. It's got this pointy tip. It's probably a cutting tool. It's probably a hand axe. And what I'm wondering is whether we can do the same sort of work on storytelling. Can you make a jump from the form of stories, the form they reliably take, to a hypothesis about their likely function? And one of the things that surprised me the most in my research was how predictable stories are. We all think of storytelling as this wildly creative, artistic form, and in many ways it is. But no matter where you go in the world, and no matter when you go there, no matter how different the people seem, no matter how hard their lives are, you always find the same amazing thing, that people tell stories. And on the whole, their stories are exactly like ours. The same basic obsessions, and the same basic simple story structures. So what's a story? Everywhere in the world, a story has a character in it, or characters. The character has some sort of problem, some sort of predicament 
some sort of trouble in their lives, and they attempt to solve it. That's what a story is. They are problem-solution narratives. And right now, many of you are racking your brains. You're trying to scrape up counterexamples, and that's good. You will be able to come up with counterexamples. But they will be very much the exceptions to prove the rule. They're going to be statistical outliers. And yeah, others of you are saying, well, this is really obvious. I knew this all along. It's obvious to me that stories are this way. But if you think about it, it's not one bit obvious that stories should be this way. Many of us might expect to find storytelling traditions where stories really did function as escape pods, <coughs> escape pods into hedonistic paradises where pleasure was unlimited and suffering was unknown. But you never, ever find that. So why? Why are stories tr so troubled? Why are they this specific way, this specific way, instead of all the other ways they could be? I think it suggests that the human mind was shaped for story, so it could be shaped by story. And I'm not alone. Many thinkers, present and past, have made arguments similar to the one I'm going to make today. In fact, what I'm going to tell you about right now comes from a, a literary scholar named Brian Boyd. And Boyd argues that animals play, especially the little ones. They have rudimentary pretense. They pretend to flee. They pretend to fight. They pretend to hunt. They pretend to get mad. They pretend to be scared. Why? It's easy. They're, they're, they're training up. They're learning the skills they're going to need to be successful adults, to, 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 to survive, to thrive. Humans play too, especially the little ones. Children's make-believe, many people don't know this, but children's make-believe, like Annabelle's little games, it's dark, it's dangerous, it's complex. Why? Again, there's no great mystery here. Psychologists agree children are building their minds, they're learning. They're rehearsing for adult life. So pretty un uncontroversial so far, but now we take a leap. Humans play at story too. I mean, adult humans play at story too. We're all like Peter Pan. No matter how old we get, we never actually leave the land of make-believe behind. We love imagining the fictional struggles of pretend people. And here's a question. Could it be that this adult form of make-believe serves essentially the same function as pretend play does for animals and for little kids. Or let's look at it from the same idea from a slightly different perspective. Some psych psychologists suggest that we should look at fiction as a powerful, ancient, virtual reality simulator that simulates the big dilemmas of human life. So you turn on the TV, you open a novel, and whoosh, you're teleported into this other world. If a story is good, you sink into a quasi-hypnotic trance. It's an authentically altered state of consciousness where you don't just sympathize with those characters, you strongly empathize with them. You feel their fear, their anger, their desire. Your brain, they can look at it in the fMRI scanner, your brain is lighting up like what is happening to the characters is actually happening to you. And the way we spend, quite literally, years of our lives marinating our brains in these stories, this has repercussions. So this guy is the great Russian novelist, Leo Tolstoy, and he believed that stories worked like infections. I love the way he puts that. They're infections. And 100 years after Tolstoy's death, more than that actually, this is exactly what psychologists are finding in the lab. Stories do indeed infect us. And not just with basic facts and information, but with big ideas, big emotion. They can do studies that consistently show that some of the biggest, deepest hopes, values, fears in your head, these are shaped by the stories we consume. And this all affects how we operate in the world. So we know children's make-believe, for instance, builds their social capacities. The cool thing is that new research suggests that this works for grown-ups too. So stories enhance our social skills, our ability to empathize, our emotional intelligence. In other words, the research seems to show that working our way through these fictional social problems, these fictional social dilemmas, actually preps us to deal with the real thing. 
So back in my classroom, I tell my students that I think we are all a little bit confused. Since stories can feel like such a pleasurable form of escape, we think that's what they're for, or even that that is all that they are for. But don't let the pleasure fool you. Stories are, I think, much closer to the opposite of escapism. Most of us, you and me, we fill our days with trivia. We make coffee, we sit in traffic, we stare at a spreadsheet, we think about what to wear tomorrow. Far from escaping from the problems of life, it's only in stories that most of us stop running away from them and finally confront all of life's dark possibilities. The danger of love, the allure of hatred, and the fact and the terror of our own mortality. And this close, intimate engagement with the big problems of life, it doesn't just slide off of you when the story ends. It sinks in. It gradually shapes you, changes you, throughout your life in the same way that flowing water will reshape a stone. So why do people tell stories? Why do we become the storytelling animal? I think we were shaped for story so we could be shaped by story. You and me, we were made to be made by story. Thanks very much.